ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. And welcome to Tesla's Q1 2020 financial results and Q&A webcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker, Mr. Martin Vieta. Senior Director for Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Well, thank you, Sherry, and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Tesla's first quarter 2020 Q&A webcast. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Zachary Kirkhorn, and a number of other executives. Our Q1 results were announced at about 1 p.m. Pacific time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings to the SEC. During the question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please press star one now if you would like to uh, join the question queue. Before we jump into Q&A, Yvonne has some opening remarks. Yvonne? Uh, thank you. So, <clears throat> Q1 ended up being a strong quarter despite many, many challenges in the final few weeks. This is the first time we've achieved positive gap net income uh, in a seasonally weak first quarter. Even with all the challenges, we achieved a 20% automotive gross margin, excluding regulatory credits, while ramping two major products. Um, what we've learned from this is that uh, we've actually learned a lot here. After all, um, after the Model 3 ramp from three years ago, um, our new products get run faster and become profitable sooner. In Q1, we produced more Model Ys in the first quarter than Model 3s in Fremont in the first two quarters. Thus far, Model Y ramp has been even faster than the Giga Shanghai ramp in Q1. Most surprisingly, in other words, we are ahead of the schedule that we were ahead of already. Um, most surprisingly, uh, Model Y was profitable already in its first quarter of production, something we haven't achieved with any product in the past. Regarding autopilot, we released a new software update for traffic lights and stop signs uh, to early access users in March and to uh, all U.S. customers uh, with, with full, self, full self driving package uh, just last week. Our cars will now automatically stop at each stop sign or traffic light until the driver gets the confirmation to proceed. Um, I, should, I should say that the car is actually capable of much more than this, uh, but we are, we are only uh, exposing functionality that we feel uh, they're quite good about and where we feel that it is a, a, probably a safety improvement. Um, we, are, we are collecting data from over a million intersections every month at this point. This, this number will grow exponentially as more people get the update and as more people start driving again. Uh, Soon we will be collecting uh, data from over a billion intersections per month. Uh, all of those uh, drive, all of those confirmations are training on neural net. Essentially, the the, the, the driver, when driving and taking action, is effectively labeling uh, the labeling reality as they drive, um, and making the neural net better and better. I think that this is an advantage that no one else has. We're, we're quite literally orders of magnitude more than everyone else combined. Um, I think this is difficult to to, to fully appreciate. Um, you know, it's the reason that they, it's, it's very difficult to have a search engine that competes with Google because. Everyone is training Google all the time with their, with, uh, with their searches. So when you search on something and you click on a link, you're training Google every time you, you do that. It's just very difficult for any, any new search engine to compete on that basis. Um, so uh, so all of those confirmations are training on neural net. Uh, and soon cars will be able to drive through an intersection without a confirmation, as well as to make turns. Um, and and we really feel we're... Uh, I feel extremely comfortable, extremely confident that uh, it will be possible to do uh, a drive from your home to your office um, most of the time with no interventions by the end of the year. Uh, so this, this, this is we, we can almost do this already with the leading edge alpha bulls uh, that I'm driving in the car. Um, uh, so let's see. On another technology front, 
the brunt of we increased the range of Model S and X DI gain, this time to 391 miles for Model S and 351 miles for Model X. And it should be said that actually the model, the, the, the real Model S range um, is, is 400 miles. Um, but when we did the last EPA test, um, unfortunately EPA left the car door open and the keys in the car. So the car, and edited this overnight, and so the car actually um, went into a waiting for driver mode and lost 2% of its range. And as a result, it had a 391 test. As soon as the EPA reopens the testing, we'll redo the test, and we're actually confident that we will achieve a 400 mile or greater range with the Model S. But to be clear, the, the, the Model S that for the past two months, the, the, the true range of the Model S, past two, two months, has been 400 miles. Um, and, and of course, we're not stopping now. We'll, we'll always continue pushing for improved range over time and improving, improving um, handling, acceleration, and all the little details that make uh, a Tesla special. For Model Y, we, we introduced a revolutionary two-piece uh, rear underbody casting um, that uh, we're um, going to be making a single-piece casting uh, later this year. Um, meaning that essentially the rear third of the body is cast in a single piece, which is no, no casting of, of this size of complexity has ever been done before. Um, in fact, there isn't even anything that is on, on par with the two-piece casting for the Model Y. So we're really pushing the envelope on vehicle structural engineering and manufacturing. I'm very excited about this, this approach as it allows us to reduce the, the weight, the cost, um, and, and improve uh, uh, NVH. It's better in every way, essentially. Um, we also, for Model Y, we also introduced a revolutionary new heat pump, uh, which uh, allows the car to have a higher range. Um, so the, the Model Y has remarkable range, uh, you know, on par with, in fact, slightly better than, I guess, the Model 3. Um, and just despite being a bigger car, that uh, weighs more. And this is, uh, the heat pump is a key contributor to that. Um, it is especially uh, excellent at low temperature driving. So, um, and, and the feedback we're, we're getting from customers who have received the, the Model Y thus far has been universally positive. Um, we're, we're confident this, this product will be our best selling product ever. So, uh, in conclusion, um, uh, and, and, and just to look at looking for, I guess this is a forward-looking statement. <laughs> um, we we are absolutely continuing uh, our Model Y capacity expansion at full speed at both Giga Berlin and Giga Shanghai, uh, and, and and here in Fremont when they will let us continue. Um, low flight production in. China and in Europe will bring the cost down, making our products even more competitive over time. Uh, while many other companies are cutting back on investment, we are doing the opposite. We are absolutely pedal to the metal uh, on new products and expanding the company. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to being in sometime next year a truly global manufacturer with major factories in uh, North America, China, and Europe and a capacity of well over a million units a year. So there's a tremendous amount to look forward to, and we we're, can't wait to tell you what's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Zach's opening remarks. Yeah, thanks, Martin, and thanks, Elon. Uh, I'm very proud of the accomplishments of the Tesla team this past quarter. Uh, a few things to highlight and add to what Elon just mentioned. We successfully launched, ramped, and demonstrated profitability of the Model Y. As Elon mentioned, significantly ahead of schedule. And this is our second large-scale product launch since Model 3 in 2017, and it's evidence to the progress we've made on cost control and ramp efficiency. It, it's hard to understate the significance of demonstrating profitability of this program in its first quarter of production. Our Shanghai Model 3 margins improved dramatically since Q4 of last year, nearing equivalence of Model 3's built-in free months. This is despite not yet running at full capacity while also managing through the production shutdown in early February. 
We also announced a long-range and performance variant of Model 3 for our roadmap, which will positively impact ASPs in China. On order rates, we did not experience much of an impact related to the expiration of government incentives at the end of Q4. In fact, we exited the quarter with our highest ever backlog yet again. Aided by these accomplishments, we are able to achieve our first ever Q1 profit. Automotive growth margin, excluding the impact of regulatory credits, remain strong for all products, despite charges taken in Q1 associated with production downtime. We continue to make progress on OPEX efficiency, as well as our service and other margins. Our energy business was impacted as well by shutdown activities in Q1, limiting deployments. We also experienced expected launch inefficiencies associated with our third version of the solar roof, which impacted overall profitability. As I've noted before, we expect regulatory credit sales, which are credits we sell to other car makers, to generally increase with time. This can be seen by the increase from Q1 relative to Q4. And note that most of the credit revenue did not contribute to cash in Q1, and it's reflected in the accounts receivable uh, on the balance sheet. Our free cash flows were impacted by the temporary, uh, by the temporary increase in end of quarter inventory for all our products, resulting from the abrupt suspension of production and delivery operations. Had these op interruptions not occurred, we were pacing towards a record quarter of deliveries and strong free cash flows. As Elon mentioned, it is extremely important that we remain on track to achieve our long-term plans and technology roadmap. We are taking the near-term actions required to continue those investments. Model Y in Shanghai and Berlin are proceeding as planned, and we're making progress on improving capacity for Model Y in Fremont and Model 3 in Shanghai. In the near term, our Shanghai factory remains operational, contributing an increasing level of cash flows and profitability to the company. In Fremont, we're working towards restarting production as soon as that's possible. We are also continuing to deliver cars that we were unable to deliver at the end of the first quarter. Our vehicle inventory balance increased by 14,000 units at the end of Q1, which was a headwind to free cash flows in Q1, but it's helpful in Q2. Note that one of the most important aspects of Model Y in Fremont and Model 3 in Shanghai is the dramatically improved cash conversion cycle by locally producing and delivering vehicles. While sales and delivery operations have paused in many areas of the world, we are still receiving many online orders, despite an ability for our customers to experience the product prior to ordering. However, unavoidably, the extended shutdown in Fremont will have an impact on our near-term financial performance, and we will need to work through how quickly we'll be able to ramp production to prior levels. More broadly, we remain focused on ensuring our cash flows are managed appropriately. Working capital management, in particular raw material inventory, is the single most important lever in managing our cash flows during this time. The Tesla team has done a great job here. We've also taken actions to eliminate or reduce non-critical expenses and optional investments, while continuing to drive efficiencies throughout the business. Overall, we've modeled many scenarios into 2021 and remain comfortable that we have sufficient liquidity to proceed fully with our most important long-term investments. Uh, it's important to note that Tesla remains an extremely agile and dynamic company, and this is aided by the substantial work we've done over the last year to improve our cost efficiency and productivity. And we have the ability to quickly adjust our spending and planning as required. So thank you again for, to the Tesla team for uh, success in Q1, and we will turn to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll take the first questions from uh, institutional investors compiled by Safe Technologies. So the first question from institutional investor is, most Tesla owners have yet to purchase or experience FSD, and despite most vehicles having all the necessary hardware, what levers could you pull to accelerate adoption and deepen your data advantage? For example, could you consider offering FSD as a premium subscription? Um, I think we, we, we will offer uh, full self-driving as a, as a subscription service, uh, but it will be um, probably towards the end of this year. Uh, it, it, I should say, it will still make sense as, as to, to buy FSD as an option, as in our, in our view, it, buying FSD is, is an investment um, in the future, and, and we are confident that it is an investment that will pay off to the consumer to the benefit of the consumer, uh, and in, in my opinion, um, buying the FSD option is something people will not regret doing. 
I agree. And, and financially rolling the upfront purchase of your of the FSD option into a loan in the vehicle or a lease is will be the least expensive way on a monthly basis to own. Plus, you preserve the option value of increased value with time. Yeah. But we do understand that some customers who have ownership or have leased their vehicles did not purchase that option upfront, and so this will enable those customers. Um, to spread out the cost of, of ownership of FSD or subscription over time. Yeah, absolutely. As you mentioned, like at a high level, our, our overall goal is to, to maximize the area under the curve of customer happiness. That that is our goal, and we think that you know that that's the kind of thing that all companies should try to do, um, and it, it's it's what, what results in long term value creation um, and you know and loyalty to get loyalty. So our goal is always really to do the best thing for the customers. Um, and, and, and we're confident that that uh, us, if, if, we, if we behave like that, that, that then the customers in turn will, will behave the same way to us. Thank you. Uh, the second question from investors is, uh, Chandra recently announced changes to its uh, NEV subsidy program that disqualified Tesla vehicles from benefiting uh, from the subsidies. To what extent is there room for Tesla to lower manufacturing costs in China and pass those savings to buyer so they can qualify for the subsidy? Yeah, so um, we are making rapid progress on lowering the production costs in China, and um, um, we're actually excited to announce on this call that we will be reducing the price of the standard range uh, Model 3 uh, uh, basically tomorrow China time, so the day after tomorrow California time, but tomorrow China time, um, and, uh, and that will that, be a price below the subsidy limit. And we're, 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 we feel confident that that will still be uh, a vehicle that delivers uh, a good gross margin. Yeah, and, and on the manufacturing cost portion of the question, uh, the uh, cost of vehicles produced in Shanghai in Q1 is already lower than the cost to produce the Model 3 in Fremont. And there's still significant opportunity left to take cost out. So fixed cost absorption from higher production volumes, which are occurring in Q2 and will occur through the rest of the year, we're not fully localized on the supply chain yet. And so while a lot of the supply chain is localized, it's not complete, and there's additional opportunities there. Um, and so we'll continue to bring the price down and expand margin, cost down and expand margin, even with this reduction in price that Elon mentioned on the standard range version of the vehicle. Thank you. The next question is, Andy Grow once said that great companies are improved by crises. Uh, in which way has Tesla improved or, or, or is expected to improve coming out of COVID-19? Well, it, 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 you know, we, it has caused us to look closely at our cost structure and um, to be more efficient as a company. Uh, that, that's, um, yeah, one always has to do that in a crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, to think about our core beliefs and, and, and what do we want to do, and we, you know, came to the conclusion that uh, that, that the, right, the right move is actually to continue to expand rapidly, continue to invest uh, in, in the future in new technologies, um, even though it is risky, um, and we've talked to some of our key investors, and they support that approach as well. So, um, you know, I think that this was clearly an uncertain, you know, future ahead, it's a bit of a bumpy road, but I think the, the long-term uh, prospects are extremely good. Anything that you guys want to add? I agree with that, Elon. Um, the um, prioritization on the key projects will enable us to execute more efficiently and faster on them, which I think is great. But the other one that I would add is it's always been our vision at Tesla to um, improve the customer experience and and make that as digital as possible. Yeah, touchless and delivery. So touchless delivery, mobile service, uh, touchless sales has been something that we've been very focused on and made a lot of progress on. Yeah, but it, um, the Tesla is the only car that you can you can literally order in, in, in less than five minutes on your phone. You can order a car and have it delivered to your doorstep with, um, with all the paperwork and everything done. That's it, effortless. And many customers do that. And, and they're doing it, yeah. In fact, a big part of it is just um, trying to communicate to people that this is something you can do because normally buying a car is quite a pain. For most people, they would rather go to the dentist than buy a new car. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, 
Um, actually, my, my dentist is great, <laughs> but it, it's really like quite an arduous thing. You, you know, um, and, and, you know, when the typical retail experience of buying a new car is um, more, more painful to people than than having a root canal, then uh, you have to say, well, um, and for Tesla, it is uh, it's completely as as easy as ordering something from the Apple App Store or ordering something on Amazon and, and, and just up to the car. Yeah. I mean, I'm, in five minutes, if, if you're really going fast, I think you could order a car probably in 90 seconds. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, the next question from institutional investor is, uh, can you give us a brief preview of the battery day by generally hi highlighting steps that like taking to improve cell uh, energy density and timeline for introduction? Um, yeah, actually, we're just, I, I, we don't want to preempt a battery day. Um, we want to leave the exciting news for, for that day. So there will be a, a lot of exciting news to, to tell. Um, and I think it's going to be one of the most exciting days in, in Tesla's history. Um, and we're just trying to figure out the right timing for that. Uh, we think probably the right timing will be the, um, probably the third week of May. Um, um, not, not giving a firm date, but we think that probably that's the right timing. Um, and uh, depending upon what we're allowed to do, it'll either be in California or Texas. Okay. And the last question from institutional investors, uh, could you please up, uh, update on progress towards development and commercialization of full self-driving? How much revenue have you recognized so far? Um, so, there's a couple of things on the financials for full self-driving. Um, and so, currently in North America, it's sold for $7,000 as an option. We take roughly half of that as revenue and the other half of it goes into deferred revenue. Um, that's associated with features that will be released with time. Our deferred revenue balance is um, continuing to grow, a little bit over $600 million. So as we release features with time, at the end of every quarter, we take a look at what features have been released, associated value, and then we can release that from the deferred revenue into our financials for that quarter. And then cars going forward, once a feature is released, we can recognize that revenue. So we reduce the amount of deferral and we can recognize that revenue within period. So I mean, this is uh, one of what we think will be one of the most powerful gross margin levers with time as the feature suite is rolled out. Absolutely. But there's also a, a tremendous amount of untapped potential in um, the, the, the fleet out there that could upgrade to turn on um, autopilot, basic autopilot, or full self-driving. Um, and that's something we will enable you know, just as a simple in-app purchase. Um, or as we talked about earlier, just you know, towards the end of the year as a subscription. So that, that's, that's just a, a lot of untapped potential there. Um, that, that's not in the deferred revenue line, obviously, um, but is certainly a great deal of deferred potential that we think of a large portion of which is likely, likely to reach fruition. Thank you. And now let's go to questions from retail investors. Uh, question number one. Uh, Elon has mentioned a 50% compound annual growth target for Tesla in the past. Is this still in line with Tesla's ambitions for the next five to ten years? This would be 4 million vehicles in 2025 and more than 20 million vehicles in 2030. Is 40% a more realistic target? Well, it, it's always difficult to, to predict uh, what the macro situation is going to be. Um, I think you know, very, very few people would have predicted you know, the, the, you know, the, the unexpected you know, roundhouse that, that COVID um, came up with that sort of came out of nowhere. Um, so, um, I think in, in the absence of something, some, some massive force majeure event, but quite massive, um, I think 50% is, is the, the, the likely number. Um, it, it's possible that it's 40%. I, I, I would be very shocked if it's less than 40%, uh, even with a force majeure, short of World War III. 
the next question from retail investors, uh, when will you announce the next giga? How many gigas do you have planned for the next five years? <laughs> um, I think we'll announce the next giga possibly as soon as uh, a month. But we may, we may announce this as soon as next month. Um, there's no prediction, it's just saying, yeah, that's, that, that could happen. Um, it will certainly be within three months, and, and possibly one month. Um, and that would be in, in the U.S. Um, so, as for how many will be in five years, I'm not, I, I don't know I, right now what that number would be. Um, I, I guess several more than there are today. But I'm not sure what, what exactly would be in five years, but some number more than today. I'll also add that uh, our gigas have gotten bigger. Yes. And um, so arguably we start being called Terra. Yes. Uh, with multiple products as well. And so, you know, the absolute number of gigafactories we may ultimately build might be less, but each one is larger. Uh, and that's under a belief that just significant efficiencies by having as much as possible and similar product lines under the same roof um, and as much vertical integration as possible all in one facility. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you give us an update on solar roof RAM? How many are you currently able to install per week? Uh, what is your installations per week's target for the end of 2021? Um, well, we weren't actually um, gaining tremendous momentum with the solar roof uh, before COVID, um, but, and COVID essentially shut us down, uh, both from the ability to install and the ability to get permits. The permit offices were closed, and, and we were we, you know, sheltered in place, loving place. So you obviously cannot install on the, if you can't get permits and you can't physically do it. It's physically impossible. So. Um, but I think the long-term trend for solar roof is extremely good, um, and I'm confident that let's say within the next, uh, you know, I don't know, year or maybe even by end of year, we should be installing um, at uh, a rate of a thousand a week. Um, uh, that's not in the in the middle of, of winter or something. It's with like it's, it's taking seasonality. I like for, for seasonality, we, it's hard to install in roofs that are covered in snow and ice. Um, but like in a, say, spring, um, I think it's in, installing, which, which is the hard part. We, we, we actually have demonstrated the ability to hit a thousand a week um, uh, first fold rate for the solar glass roof already. So that's not uh, that's not a problem. Uh, it's, it's building up the install team. Uh, building up the third-party channel uh, installers, the, roof, the roofing industry installers, um, and, uh, and and internally we want to have at least a thousand a thousand install roof and install team uh, with um, and taking a week or perhaps less than a week to do an install, which gets you a thousand a week uh, roof installation. We see demand is demand is good, production is good, uh, so it's really all about the install. Um, and then, and then, like I said, also building the uh, training, the, the, the very um, diverse uh, group of of, of, in, in, of companies in the roofing industry to also install solar roofs that I think will scale, allow us to scale you know, far beyond a thousand a week. Um, we're also seeing a lot of interest outside of North America, um, so we do expect to see a product that is international. Um, and, and actually seeing a tremendous amount of interest from China on, on the solar roof. So um, we're confident this, this will be a very significant product for the company over time. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, can you elaborate on Tesla's plan to enter the residential and or commercial HVAC market? Can you provide some basics of how uh, your system will work? Will you consider the heat pump water heater market as well? Um, <clears throat> well, as I said, on. Twitter. I'm personally extremely excited to build a kick-ass HVAC system that also has, a, a, you know, sort of hospital-grade um, particle filtration, basically HEPA filtration that filters out 
um, um, viruses, bacteria, um, pollen, uh, fungi, um, and uh, it also neutralizes uh, acidic al alkaline gases. Um, that is that is quiet um, and efficient, uh, and uh, these are all things we've achieved in, in, in our cars. But in fact, I don't know if a lot of people realize, but the Model S and X are the only cars in the world that have a hospital operating room grade, like uh, and, uh, fungi, um, and uh, it also neutralizes uh, acidic al alkaline gases. Um, that is that is quiet um, and efficient, uh, and uh, these are all things we've achieved in, in, in our cars. But in fact, I don't know if a lot of people realize, but the Model S and X are the only cars in the world that have a hospital operating room grade, like uh, HEPA filters built in. They're very big. So, um, but you can get to a, a particle count that is insanely low uh, with uh, with our cars. And um, 3 and Y have like MERV 16 or 15 capable filters. Yeah. Also, which is it's not like Model 3 and Y are, are there, are no there are no slouches. Model 3 and Y are also way, they're way better than any other car, that's my knowledge. Uh, they're not quite as good as possible operating room, but they're extremely good. W way better than any other normal car. Um, and we're continuing to improve the, the cultures on 3 and Y. Um, I guess this, this, these actually have a big effect on health, even in normal, just day-to-day -day living, is, is reducing um, particle count. Um, and, and uh, you know, it has an effect on allergies and all sorts of things. So it's, it's really, um, air quality is incredibly important. It, 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 even in a non-COVID situation, it's pretty important. So you know, t taking all those things that we've learned and applying them to home HVAC would be, and commercial HVAC would be just very exciting. Um, and, um, and then if you've, if you've got, if you're condensing water, like why not also have it be a water source? Um, if you have water, Possibly could then heat the water and, and have a water heater as well. Yeah, and use it as a heat source if you need it instead of the outdoors when the outdoors is really cold. Yeah. Or the other way around. So, lots of options. It could be a hell of a product. Um, so, we, we just have to, you know, to tell us we have a tendency to buy a point we can chew on the product front. So, we, we got to make sure we, we, we have a lot of um, irons in the fire here for, for new products with the. Motor trucks, semi, road, uh, new roadster, um, you know, and, and the, the, get the bigger factories in various parts of the world, uh, and it's building up Model Y, and autopilot, and the solar roof, and new technology. Uh, yeah, exactly. Totally. Power wall, power, power pack, mega pack. Um, but we are seeing tremendous demand for stationary storage, uh, more than more than we can supply, uh, at least at least for 2020. Thank you. And the last question from these retailers, um, when will Tesla start acquiring uh, utilities like the Hornsdale Power Reserve and Moss Landing instead of selling them battery storage? Does it make sense for Tesla to buy future plants and convert them? Well, we haven't really thought about that yet. Um, it's, not, it's not out of the question, but uh, our brain is full. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, sir. I'm not ready for. It's not another question. Um, you know, our, our, our overarching goal is to help accelerate the advent of sustainable energy, and um, you know, with, and the, the three elements of that are sustainable power generation. Then you've got to store the power, uh, station storage, and then you've got to have uh, electric transportation. Um, so, and. Um, we don't have, like, say, specific market share goals or anything like that. It's just to the degree that we can accelerate the advent of sustainable energy, we think that's a fundamental good for the world, and we want to do that as fast as possible. But it's not, like, say, market share growth. You know, it's going in and of itself. It's just, you know, fast as happens, the better the world, the better the world is. Thank you very much. And uh, I think now we can move to analyst questions. Thank you. Our first question will come from Adam Jonas with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Um, thanks, everybody. I hope everyone's uh, safe and, and healthy. Um, I got one question, one follow up, and, and I point out I, I've had a root canal before, and I would agree, Elon. It was less painful than buying a car. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, it, it, really, it's, it's, it's yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a big problem, actually. It's a big problem. It's different, yes. different conversations. Um, uh, Zach, first for you, any real-time update on company liquidity at the end of April? Some, some companies have, you know, given the circumstances, gone out of their way to give a little color on that. Just wanted to give you a shot at that. And I got a follow-up. Yeah, it's a fair question. Um, I don't have any additional color to provide. So $8.1 billion in cash and cash equivalents at the end of Q1. We're managing it very closely. Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we do have uh, an increase in inventory of vehicles um, that we were unable to deliver at the end of Q1. So we're making progress delivering those through April, which is helpful for liquidity. And you know, as we've been looking at liquidity, we've been looking at this over the next 18 months. And there's ups and downs to the, to the liquidity. Um, you know, currently now, as we're not producing, we still have payables from Q1 that we're paying off. But then in a couple of months, we'll quickly be through that. And then we'll have a gap in payables since we don't have any parts coming in. So it does go up and down a little bit. But you know, in looking at the long-term horizon, which is how we're managing it right now, we feel pretty comfortable with the liquidity position we can yeah, yeah. I should Thanks. say we we are a bit worried about you not know, being able to resume production um, in the Bay Area, and, and that should be identified as a serious risk. Um, that, you know, that we have, we we only have two car factories right now: one in Shanghai and one in mm -hmm. the Bay Area. And the Bay Area produces the vast majority of our cars, uh, all of F and X, um, uh, uh, and and most of the three and all of the Y. So um, the, the the extension of the shelter in place, uh, or frankly, I would call it forcibly imprisoning people in their homes uh, against all their constitutional rights, with, in my opinion, and breaking people's freedoms in ways that are horrible and, and, and wrong, uh, and not why people came to America or built this country. What the fuck? Excuse me. Um, people acting with outrage. It's an outrage. Um, so, uh -huh. um, but it, it will cause great harm, not just to Tesla, but to any company. Um, and while Tesla will weather the storm, there are many small companies that will not. And, and, and all people's, everything people have worked for their whole life is, gonna get, is being destroyed in real time. Um, and we're going to have many suppliers, and are, are having many suppliers that are having super hard times, especially the small ones. Um, and it, it's, it's causing a lot of strife to a lot of people. Well, Elon, on that point, you, know, you mentioned people that gave their lives to build the country. Um, my, my thoughts for you on this. There have been a lot of comparisons you know, drawn to the you know, Save the U.S. economy to the early 1930s when Roosevelt began a series of New Deals and infrastructure projects, or post-World War II when Eisenhower launched the U.S. Highway Act and when JFK launched the Apollo program, which you could say was influenced by the Cold War, clearly and you've benefited from and our space program benefited from, what would be your message to U.S. lawmakers on this call as we, in addition to your, your opinions on shelter in place, but, you know, thinking longer term, your message to U.S. lawmakers coming out of the crisis, specifically around EV infrastructure and a, ch a chance to kind of, you know, work with taxpayers to support sustainable transport and renewable energy. I'm wondering if you see this, you know, as a chance to make, make the crisis and, and all the loss and lives lost not be in vain. Thanks. I think it's high time we invested in infrastructure in this country. We have a lot of cr you know, crumbling highways and bridges, and, um, and, and frankly, um, you know, when I visit China, I, I, I see their infrastructure as being much better than ours. It's, it's great. Um, um, Europe has better infrastructure. It's, it's, it's really quite sad the, the U.S. infrastructure. Um, especially sort of roads and highways is, is, is where it is today. Uh, and our, our airports, um, in a lot of cases, are, are, are an embarrassment. Um, so, yeah, and it's not just a question of money, it's a question of will. Um, you know, sometimes we spend a lot of money on these things, but what do we gain for it? For it? Um, so, you know, and, and yeah, we, we really need to be thinking about what is the transportation of the future, of the transportation of the past. Of the past. Um, you, know, you know, if this was... Uh, 1920. Do you want to be investing in steam engines or internal combustion engines? But, you know, obviously, not, not steam engines. So, um, you know, this is a time to think about the future. 
um, and, and also to ask, you know, are, is, is it right to infringe upon people's rights as, as what is what is happening right now? Um, I, think the, I think the people are going to be very angry about this and are very angry. Um, you know, it's like if somebody should be, if somebody wants to stay in their house, that's, that's great. They should be allowed to stay in their house and they should not be compelled to leave. But to say that they cannot leave their house um, and they will be arrested if they do, this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is, a, this is fascist. This is not democratic. This is not freedom. Give people back their goddamn freedom. Okay, let's go to the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Emmanuel Rosner with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Um, question on, on Model Y. Um, I was hoping you can elaborate a little bit more on the drivers of uh, how the gross margin is already positive at such low volume. Um, how much of it is a function of the commonality with the Model 3? What other factors should we think about? And what does that mean for the ampler uh, for uh, the eventual gross margin on Model Y? Yeah. Sure. Um, so the couple of thoughts there for why. Um, uh, the first is, you know, it does carry a higher ASP. So on the revenue side, it carries a higher ASP than Model 3. And the deliveries that we started with were of the higher ASP versions of the cars. So we started with deliveries of performance um, uh, initially. And so that helps create some of the margin. Um, and that will come down with time as more variants are released, and we have more of a steady state mix. But it, it's similar to the ASP trends that we had with Model 3 when we launched that product in Fremont two years ago. Uh, on the cost side, and I think you hit on a couple of the buckets, the commonality is huge. It's very important. And in addition to that, manufacturing processes are very similar to Model 3 as well. And so we've experienced with that both with Model 3 in Fremont and then as well in Shanghai. And it helps to have an existing factory with existing workforce and knowledge here as well. So the ecosystem to support and launch the product is there. Um, th there remain a, a lot of opportunities to take, continue to take costs out of the car. And the, the number of vehicles that we've built in the first quarter is quite limited relative to where we'll go. Yeah, it, it, we take costs out of the car and to make the product better. So it's, exactly. it's not make the product worse. It's, uh, any fool can take costs out of a car and make it worse. Um, we, we want to take out cost out of the car, figure out how to make it lighter uh, and, and, and simpler. Um, and, and so it's, it's what the car to just, just incrementally improve as well as incrementally lower in cost. Um, but, you know, for, for a five-seater Model Y, we, we, we expect, um, you know, marginal cost back to 10 or 20,000 units or something like that. And, and, and I've gone... Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. Your conference will resume momentarily. Thank you.
we can go all kinds of things. Speakers, you're back online. Hi, sorry, we got disconnected for some reason. Um, uh, what was the question again? Okay, uh, let's go to the next question, please. The next question comes from Ben Callow with Baird. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, it, it, just wondering about the the cell strategy. You know, in uh, in Reno, you have uh, obviously uh, integrated uh, there, but uh, you're buying cells. I, I think in Shanghai and uh, what we think is, is in Germany, uh, and so. How, how, how are you looking at, at that going forward? And then, could you just talk about Mr. Mizuno uh, and that board addition and, and kind of the, the process with, with adding him to the board? Thank you. Uh, sure. From a self perspective, you know, uh, with all the partners we've had historically and in, in the future, we're just looking for. Uh, competitive technology and competitive pricing. Um, uh, I think we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, um, in Battery Investor Day, like how, how we're approaching all of it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we don't have like one model where we're restricting ourselves to, to pursue. We're just trying to find what's best for the products and, the, and, and in the long run. Um, and then another question about the board. So I could, we could not hear the second part of the question. Yeah, I was asking about Mr. Mizuno uh, enter, entering the board uh, and, and kind of the process behind that and what he brings to the board. Oh, I think, I think um, well, we all need a hero. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, but, but obviously, if you bring a tremendous amount of uh, experience investing at the highest levels in the world, um, and has done um, incredible work as uh, in, at the Japan uh, Pension Fund, which is the, the largest uh, fund of, of any kind in the world, um, and uh, you know, generally, the conversations over the years, I've just shown incredible insight into. Um, how, how the security, the global security markets work, and what he thinks is where, you know, whether errors for reform. Um, uh, it just it seems like to have a, a strong philosophical understanding about um, you know, how to make the future better. And um, he sh shares that view regarding the environment. And um, just a very, a very sensible, smart person um, who brings a lot to the board. And um, I think uh, it's generally recognized as such by uh, like by many people. I guess, I guess linking in to the Panasonic relationship, uh, maybe just uh, uh, you know, how is that relationship going here? And, and is there any read through on bringing him on to the board? Thank you. Um, no, I think this has got nothing to do with the Panasonic relationship. Um, I, I mean. I have a great relationship with the Panasonic CEO. We, we meet regularly, one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, talk all the time. And you know, uh, so that, that relationship is, is strong. Um, uh, the, 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 you know, he, he would bring more of um, a broader and global strategic uh, peer to the board. Thank you. Let's go to the next question, please. Our next question will come from Gene Munster with Loop Ventures. Please go ahead. Congratulations on the progress. And you talked about full autonomy by the end of the year. I would love for you to walk through the rollout strategy of the Tesla network app and how that's going to look prior to the robo-taxi stage. Are you going to gradually take over human routes with autonomous capable routes over time, or how do you see that playing out? Well, it's pretty much going to play out as as it has play, played out, which is we'll um, re release more and more functionality. Um, you know, before we reach, re release any functionality, it goes through extensive testing. Of course, we run it. We have a 
a simulation team that uh, has a, doing a very good simulation of the real world. Um, so we, we run any code changes through a battery test and simulation. Then we um, have a, a level QA team, which I'm on actually. I'm one of um, the, on the global QA team. Um, and, and we test uh, the, the releases in the real world, spot the real world path, the differences between the real world and the simulation, which is which are very, very, very many because the world is very complex and weird. Uh, and then we re release it to a small group of uh, private beta testers within the company, then to a, a larger beta audience, uh, including people outside the company, then to uh, early access. Uh, uh, Tesla owners, uh, and then finally a border release. Um, and so there's, there are many stages that these things go through. So if, if by the time something is being re going to wide release in the US, it, um, it has gone through all of those stages. And the software that's at the, at the very early stage is much more advanced than what people are seeing. So um, it's just got to go through a, a, a very rigorous safety uh, uh, so, it, you know, essentially, we, we need to um, figure out you get, get very good at complex intersections, get very good at complex turns in intersections, um, and um, you know, things like um, if it's busy uh, malls in a parking lot or um, office park or uh, special events and sporting events, that kind of thing. And those eventually come back. Um, but yeah, these, those, those are those are extra hard cases. Um, but it, it's all tracking very well. I feel like the autopilot engineering team is um, it, it, we just have an extremely talented group, um, and uh, I'm, I'm deeply involved with the team. Um, So we talk every week uh, and, and meet every week when we can because now it's a political meeting is difficult. Um, so I have a, quite a deep understanding of where we are, where we're headed, and um, I feel like we're, we have a tremendous amount of momentum and, and we'll have the functionality that's very full, um, full self driving by the end of the year. Um, now, after that functionality is released, there's, there's still another step, which is to Improve the reliability of it uh, once it's released. Um, so you can have cool self driving with, with human supervised with, with, with by the driver. And, and then if we keep improving the reliability to the point where um, it, it no longer needs to be supervised by the driver. And we provide a, a vast body of data to regulators to show them that this is the case. Uh, and then presumably the regulators, depending on, on which jurisdiction it is, would give approval for. Fully autonomous cars that can drive with no human on board. Um, obviously, the regulatory approval process that's difficult for us to um, predict uh, with accuracy because it's out of our hands. But um, for the rest of the day, I feel like it's back to where we are. So, we to, are. to su summarize, we want we're going to get uh, owners full autonomy, some uh, level of that by the end of the year, and then a human in yeah. the loop. Test on network app sometime uh, is the first half of next year. Would that be the hope? Do <clears throat> uh, you, you mean like um, we're going to car drive with no, no person on board? No, uh, with a person, initially a person to observe. Would that be with the Tesla network app? Would that be really part of the year of 2021? Is that the hope? If described as a hope, I would say that's. that's only fair description. Okay. And then, you know, kind of take it to its uh, end stage, the robo taxi stage. Any high level thoughts? Understand the regulatory is a massive unknown. But uh, if you're going to put a guess on it, where would we start? When would we start seeing robo taxis? Well, I think. I think I think it's, it's quite likely in 
my view, um, again, I could be wrong, I'm, you know, I, I'm, you know, as, as you see, we're ahead in some areas and we're behind in others. Because when I give when I when I give when I give a guess, I give the guess that I think is the the, the, the likely midpoint, not the, the point with lots of margin. Um, if, if this is normal distribution, I give you the 50th percentile, uh, not the three sigma, you know, optimistic or pessimistic. Um, so then that naturally means at least half my predictions will be wrong and half will be right. Yeah, I mean, um, or it might be right, but offset by you know, a few weeks to you know, a few months, in some cases, a few years. Um, but uh, I think that everything I've ever said would come true, did come true, it may come true late, but it, is, uh, it did come true. Um, so, um, the punctuality is not my strong suit, um, but I always come through in the end. Right. So, I, you know, I think we could see Robo taxis in operation with network fleet next year. It's not in all markets, but in some. Thank you. And let's go to the last question, please. The last question will come from Pierre Ferru with New Street. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Um, one on gross margin first, uh, and uh, your uh, impressive performance in Q1. So. There are three moving parts. Uh, the day range from credits, of course, um, the Model Y ramping, even if it, if it broke even, it probably took uh, average gross margin down. And of course, you had like Fremon being closed, uh, shut down the last week of the quarter. It probably was the sort of an extra cost. And so when I looked at how gross margin evolved sequentially, excluding these three moving parts, I felt like the, your auto gross margin could have been up like a couple of points uh, sequentially, so I, I wanted to check with you uh, if that estimate uh, would make sense, and then I would have a follow up on energy storage. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so the thing, the three things that you mentioned, it's, it's a little bit of a hard time hearing the full question here because we're having a bit of network difficulty in the room. But I'll do my best here. So when we look at margin, we do exclude credits, uh, as you have, so I agree with that. Uh, model Y ramping, bringing down overall gross margin, I agree with that as well. So it was lower than the overall average, uh, and that will increase with time. And um, uh, shutdown and efficiencies in both Shanghai and in Fremont also weighed on margin. Uh, and uh, the Shanghai margin was below the average as well, even though it's increasing quickly and approaching model three, it's still is below the average. And so I, I, I think that sentiment of your question was if you were to remove those factors, was there a sequential increase in gross margin? I haven't specifically calculated that, but I, I think your intuition is right. Uh, we saw um, strength in gross margin across the board, as I mentioned, and in particular, FNX gross margins continue to improve. Um, you know, despite slightly lower volumes there and higher fixed cost amortization. So there's good progress happening both on the ASP side and the cost reduction side for our products in production. And, and I think this also lends itself to you know, the power of the gross profit contribution to the company once we get through these ramp inefficiencies, we get Fremont up and running again, we increase capacity so we can spread out fixed costs uh, and continue to execute on cost reductions on our products. We feel very optimistic about that path going forward. Thanks. And I had a quick follow-up on, on energy storage, if you can hear me well. Um, I think, like, I can't remember, um, I think from the very first uh, days I heard you on the calls, you've always mentioned that demand for energy storage is always outstripping supply, and you have more orders than you can meet. And so I'm kind of thinking there will be, there should be an inflection point in that business at some point, and it's going to be driven by your ability to add much more manufacturing capacity, like battery manufacturing capacity. And at a high level, uh, how, how are you thinking about that inflection point uh, in terms of timeline? Uh, 
Um, in terms of timeline, I, I think what we've been doing with, with uh, both our partners and internally is looking at how to reduce the fundamentally the cost of, of investments in new sales capacity. Um, because when you look at um, a car, a vehicle product, you know, there's a lot of things in the vehicle besides the cells. When you look at an energy storage project product, it's really just the cells. And so to really grow the energy storage business, it's all about cell investment. And so that's, that's what we've been focused on. And, and, and I, I think, you know, not to give too much away, but we'll, that'll be one of the things we address in, in Battery in, in Investor Day is, is how we're, we're focused on that. Um, and and when, we, when we have that in the place we want, it'll be a lot easier to scale that business. Thank you very much uh, for all your great questions. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have today, uh, and we'll speak to you again in three months' time. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Well, so everybody, there you have it. That is the Q1 call. Um, there was some good information in there, but uh, I really wanted to see or hear the actual revenue um, that they made, not just with the Model Y, but overall for Q1. And we didn't get that, but I'm sure there's a document out there floating around um, that I will go ahead and post out here um, once this video hits hits uh, YouTube um, to share that with you guys so you can see it. But uh, just wanted to say thanks again for tuning in. I truly appreciate it. And the chat is open. If you guys want to you know, uh, post any comments, please feel free. Um, I'll let it run for about another 15 minutes or so, and uh, we'll take it from there. So uh, thanks again for tuning in. Truly appreciate it. <laughs> Callie, always great to see you, man. Yeah, the battery day is going to be pretty amazing. According to Elon, it is going to be the biggest news in Tesla history. So they must have something uh, really big cooking. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing battery packs come out here within the next year, um, 600 miles of range, which would be absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. My pleasure. So if you haven't checked out my video about the um, the SAS or Tesla being a SAS, yeah, hopefully cobalt free. Absolutely, Kelly, I agree 100%. Um, if you haven't seen the video about me talking about Tesla being a SaaS or a software as a service provider, um, go back and check it out because I went into some financial details there about what they could be potentially making if they were to do that with just a small portion of the fleet that they currently have um, for those who didn't opt into some of those features like full self-driving and other things. So, um, you know, we have the the acceleration boost for two grand. There's just going to be some features that they're going to continue to add as it relates to that. So it's going to be really interesting to see where they are a year from now as it relates to software as a service. You too, buddies. Take care. Be safe out there.
All right, so it looks like the room's getting a little bit smaller, and I do apologize. We usually have a ton of people in the room. It just must have been one of those nights where everybody was busy. I see a couple people popping back in, but um, keep it here for another minute or two. And, um, you know, yeah, comment down below. What did you guys think about the call? Not a ton of information, some. Um, battery day, third week of May, potentially, in California or Texas. Um, again, that's going to be a, a big day for Tesla. Um, what else do we have here? They talked about the new um, 2020.12.6 update where Elon stated that they already have over a million intersection transitions or confirmations already recorded from the fleet back to the mothership and they expect to have up to a billion very, very soon. So you guys are all Tesla owners or been doing your research on Tesla. You know that how important that information is to get back to uh, the fleet or from the fleet back to Tesla so they can continue to improve on those features. So that was actually quite amazing because um, that software just hit most vehicles um, last week. So it's just amazing to see how quickly people are engaged in using that feature and sending that information back so yeah um again just waiting to hear some numbers um from profit from a profitability perspective on all tesla vehicles hopefully they'll have that um in a document posted very soon all right kelly you take care of yourself man always good to see you on the chat truly appreciate your time take care of yourself All right, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and end the stream here, folks. I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. We truly do appreciate it. I hope you found the earnings call live um, informative for you. And if you haven't been on one before, um, come back because I do this every time, whether there's an unveil, uh, a launch, or um, an earnings call. So you can always come here for your information. And please don't forget to go back and check out the buzz, um, subscribe, uh, check out a few of the videos. I have a bunch of them up there for everybody to review. I hopefully there's something for everyone. Uh, but just again, wanted to say thanks. Truly appreciate it. Have a great night. Stay safe and be well. Take care.